Sarah Kemba is a writer and academic. She is Professor of New Technologies of Communication at Goldsmith University of London. Her work incorporates new media, photography, and feminist cultural approaches to science and technology. Publications include a novel and a short story, The Optical Effects of Lightning, 2011, and The Mysterious Case of Mr. Charles D. Levi, 2010. Her latest monograph with Joanna Selinska is Life After New Media, Mediation as a Vital Process, from MIT, 2012. She co-edits the journals of Photographies and Feminist Theory, and previous publications include Virtual Anxiety, Photography, New Technologies and Subjectivity, 1998, Cyber Feminism and Artificial Life, 2003, and the co-edited volume Inventive Life, Towards the New Vitalism, 2006. With Janice Jeffries, Sarah Camber is co-PI, how do you call it? PI. PI, co-PI of an RCUK funded project on digital publishing, part of CREATE, which is the Center for Creativity, Copyright, Regulation, Enterprise and Technology. And towards this project, she's currently writing an article entitled Why Write? Feminism, Publishing and the Politics of Communication. And Sarah is also in the process of setting up the Goldsmiths Press, which she will hopefully be talking about today. So here is Sarah. Okay, thanks. Um, so let me just see if I can get my. Are you loading me up? Yeah. Okay, um, thanks. So, this, uh, um, my title is a little facetious, uh, <laughs> to say the least. Um, I've kind of taken my cue from actually a piece I enjoyed very much. Um, by Joanna Drucker in the LA Review of Books and the nicely named Pixel Dust, uh, Illusions of Innovation in Scholarly Publishing. I mean, she's basically um, making an argument against too much hype um, about the transition from print to digital um, by saying, look, it's distracting um, and distracting with potentially disastrous consequences for something called scholarship. So it's this something called scholarship that I want to worry a bit about <coughs> right now because it seems to me, in her argument at least, it's a little bit too fixed, too essential, too eternal a notion. Um, and she suggests we're taking it for granted quite badly and while we all obsess about our e-books and our apps and our blogging and multimodality seems to be the latest thing, um, we're sort of taking all this scholarship for granted um, and something quite sinister is happening, which is the system that supports humanistic knowledge itself is at risk, so she claims. So I have a number of questions about these assertions. And the first and foremost, of course, is at least an apparent um, essentialization of scholarship as something that is arduous <laughs> and serious and takes place over your entire life and it's founded on expertise and professionalism and you know I get it I think in the context of uh, academic capitalism in the context of so much TED thinking TED thinking is something I nicked from Umer Hack in his piece um, Harvard Business Review it's very good let's save great ideas from the ideas industry yay um, he's actually not having a go at TED talks for who would dare do such a thing. Um, <laughs> we all love hate them, don't we? Uh, um, TED thinking is shorthand for reductionism, instrumentalism, technicism ad absurdum. Uh, the bottom paragraph pretty much says it in the first sentence. TED thinking assumes complex social problems are essentially engineering challenges. It does indeed. Um, so in the face of all this, I get a kind of pre preservational approach to scholarship. Um, I think it's understandable, I think it's too reactionary, and I'm not sure that we should, and I'm not sure that, that we can preserve what is effectively a very conservative idea, and it is an idea of scholarship, which, as Janneke Adema's work shows, I think, very well, uh, is founded and kind of <laughs> embedded in the print book, in the elite university, and also, and something I'll come back to in a bit, the, the hugely normative figure of the scholar, um, which is pretty much up for grabs, I think, at the moment. Um, in any case, when it comes to risk, what's this risk business? Um, until very recently in my life, I have totally elided the management approach to risk. 
um, in favour of something far more mischievous and activist and kind of attuned to Rosie Brodotti's incitements to bad behaviour of various kinds and conceptual risk-taking. Uh, so I'm kind of, you know, more on that uh, uh, track. Um, basically, the, pro the problem with, uh, with uh, crisis models, including of publishing and the humanities and scholarship, is that they produce conservative reactions. And I see a lot uh, um, of, of both of those things in this research that Yannicka mentioned on, um, for CREATE, which is on uh, copyright reform in the creative industries, particularly in my case in the context of publishing. So um, there's CREATE, it's a centre, it's a really large conglomerate for universities and projects, uh, Centre for Creativity, Regulation, Enterprise and Technology, and here I am in theme four, um, down the list somewhere, um, doing stuff on whose book is it anyway, IP collaborative business models, and questions of ethics and creativity in digital publishing. Um, this, this research that, that we do on this, I work with Janice Jeffries, is, I like to think scholarly, but it certainly isn't founded in expertise or professionalism. I write about copyright, I'm not a copyright lawyer, I do research on publishing and I was not until very recently and probably I'm not yet a publisher. Um, but you know, there's a legitimate investment here which is a political investment, uh, intellectual investment in the future of academic publishing and the future of academic writing. Um, in fact, I'm about to write a paper on this, the one that, uh, that uh, Yannicka mentioned, which will effectively argue that we should de-legalise the debate on copyright, which sounds a bit odd, but I think that's probably what we need to do if we're going to have a sensible conversation about the underlying politics of communication and the possibilities, such as they are, of opening out writing and academic scholarship in the context of digital publishing. Um, so my intervention here in, and in other contexts I think is founded on being able to identify two very different kinds of temporality and the problem with crisis models is that they have a kind of from to temporality. We move from this thing to this thing. Uh, it's progressive inherently, it's deterministic, um, it's preferred by government, it's preferred by industry, it's preferred within this larger more pervasive uh, market-led rationality, of course. So I think when Joanna Drucker picks up the crisis model uh, in order to criticise the move from print to digital as an innovation of... Uh, an illusion of innovation, sorry. Um, you know, I think she just makes a, a mistake that's very easy to make, which is you pick up the crisis model, you pick up its temporality. Um, and it's not helpful, ultimately. So... Uh, Away from that, my mm, more kind of political, intellectual investments, this activism, this mischief making is focused on two projects right now that I'm hoping at some point will come together. Um, the, f the first one is my second novel, which seemed to be a very bad idea at the time, but it's too late now. Um, it, it, it's a bit like my first novel, which, there it is, Optical Effects of Lightning. It is intended to work, at least intended to work, <laughs> as fiction while kind of constituting a mode, a method, a way of doing and a way of making new media studies, science and technology studies. Um, the new one, I have to say, I'm only a sixth of the way through, roughly. So I don't have anything to show you, really, at this. What I might do is put the first chapter up on the wiki and we'll see how that goes. Um, but it's, it's called A Day in the Life of Janet Smart. It's turning out to be quite a day. Um, it's a feminist critique of smart media and smart technologies, and the temporalities of smart media and smart technologies. Um, it will, in ways I really haven't figured out yet, intersect with a mid-length digital print-on-demand academic monograph uh, called iMedia, uh, The Gendering of Objects, Environments, and Smart Materials, which, when I actually start it, will be written in various uh, forms of the manifesto, uh, the publishers have asked me to think about a series on gender, on new technologies and new media, simultaneously asked me who, what, where their main competition was these days. My answer to that question has something to do with this other project, <laughs> which is the one a lot of you know about, um, uh, which involves kind of trying to set up a digital first academic publishing house uh, at the Goldsmiths Press. Uh, plans for this, I have to say, are at a critical juncture which is the, you know, basically the endless resubmission of business plans. Um, 
a little note on my business plan was, by the way, this is to management, a digital first academic publisher is not the same thing as a digital only academic publisher. This is helpful information. Um, business plans I have, I've discovered um, have to have a, a long list of risks attached to them. They have to have a long list of alternatives attached to them. It was in the business plan that I learned to speak the language of risk management, of course, as you would assume. Um, under alternatives, alternatives to setting up the Goldsmiths Press, do nothing. Um, do a digital-only publisher. Do a print-only publisher. Um, it sounds odd to say that now. Um, digital-only publishing, some of you will disagree. Uh, um, I think it's widely said it's got ahead of the market. Uh, it probably is the outcome of a little bit too much pixel dust, to use Drucker's uh, uh, title. Probably doesn't take enough account of the continuities between uh, print and digital publishing. Print only publishing, or when you say it, it sounds like an anachronism, and yet we look around us and traditional publishers uh, in academia and trade make very little use of uh, digital affordance, very, very little use of the digital environment. Um, so if we are saying, and I, clearly we are, and we have been for some time, that hybrid publishing is the way forward, um, I think we need to worry a little bit more about what that means. Hybrid publishing means analog digital, but it, I think for me too it means something to do with the way in which we combine traditional and non-traditional writing and publishing. Um, nevertheless, the thing I like most about hybrid publishing is that it messes up crisis models. Um, so I've only been sort of involved in this area for a little while, but in that time I've said quite a lot about why we should avoid what I call fa false dichotomies in the way that we talk about um, publishing. Because I think they structure what we say, because I think that they delimit what we are able to say, and of course one of the founding dichotomies would be print, digital, divide, which is not helpful. Um, an opposition for me between fluid and fixed books is not that helpful. And for me, also, closed and open access uh, doesn't really work. Um, I know a lot of you disagree, uh, but the open access debate for me is, is top-heavy, it's ideological, it's policy-driven, here in the UK at least. It does proffer a business model, for sure. I worry about that business model when it relies on article or author processing charges. Um, in the context of the UK, I think all of that means the preferred route is gold open access with article, stroke, author, processing charges. What that actually means for me is effectively a way of streamlining what, what's done, the research that gets done in the arts, in the humanities and in the social sciences. So it's extraordinarily pernicious on that level. Nevertheless, the Goldsmiths Press will be <laughs> um, and will not be an open access um, publisher, meaning that yes, of course, it will try and incorporate principles of the open access movement, the more uh, bottom-up stuff, uh, combining uh, accessible, free, where possible, content with hopefully a fair, definitely a varied pricing scheme designed to yeah, keep our heads above water, and I have to say that to college who are funding this and make us sustainable, um, but also designed to try and avoid exploiting either, either or, either the, the, the readers, users, consumers, or the producers, creators, authors uh, of content, clearly. Um, so part of my thinking behind the press, really, was trying to sift this notion of open from the notion of ethical in publishing. Um, ethics is really interesting, and I know Andre knows a lot more about it in the context of mattering press, but it, it takes you in the direction, I guess, of thinking more about process, publishing process, publishing relations, very uh, 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 positive direction to think in. Probably now, I would want to be a bit more cautious than I have been and that other people have been in avoiding another split, another dichotomy in this case between uh, um, the objects, the artifacts of publishing the books, uh, etc., the apps, whatever it's going to be, and the processes involved in publishing, uh, the entities, if you like, and the relations. I don't think it's necessarily helpful to split those things either. Um, so one of the things, I mean, so ethical publishing and open access publishing for me are slightly separate things, but they're often related in practice. Um, one of the things that, that goes on here with Mattering Press, with OHP, with Goldsmiths Press, is a, a desire to look again at the scholarly practices that underpin humanities that was fundamentally always or absolutely never in crisis. <laughs> 
that's kind of disrupted, that's deconstructed, not by the digital, not by any from to temporality, uh, but by an ongoing, uh, um, long-standing process of engaging and coming up against and absorbing and in a philosoph philosophical speech, becoming with whatever it is that the humanities isn't, basically. Um, and the scholarly uh, practices uh, uh, um, that underpin the humanities are no more or less stable, yes, than the humanities. But of course, they are stabilized. They're normalized, they're performed, they're ritualized. They're increasingly indicative of the viral spread of uh, uh, audit culture within the sort of body of the academy, as we know. Um, fundamentally, for me, the, 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 the ultimate division is Bergson's split of, of time and space, which for me gives off to a, a, an unhelpful, uh, very common division between what's vital and creative and what's instrumental or what's experimental um, and what's institutional uh, and institutionalized. I just came across this very good piece, by the way, in, um, in the journal Differences, uh, it's a recent edition, by Mark Garrett Cooper and John Marks, called Crisis, 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 Big Media and the Humanities Workforce, which is, it was, I think, something very similar about, you know, how actually, uh, um, you know, uh, you, we can regard institutionalization of scholarship as a form of experimentation. So, in other words, let's not make those, let's not make those divisions. It's only really where they come together, all these things, yeah? Uh, where, where cuts are made, where stabilizations occur, where instrumental, um, instrumentalities are found, that, that we get the chance to come in, that we get the chance to, to, to intervene. And so, in other words, I guess scholarship for me is, is a vital thing, and it's an instrumental thing. <laughs> it's fundamentally institutional, and it's also fundamentally experimental. Um, we cannot free it, liberate it, reform it, transform it, but we can probably instrumentalize it or institutionalize it a bit better. And what that means for me, doing it better, is, um, is, is in, in a Haraway phrase, staying with the trouble of academic capitalism, of, of not sort of doing what Joanna Drucker absolutely does, which is take an ahistorical approach to scholarship and, and remove it from the contemporary neoliberal academy it's un, and, and try and keep it preserved and untouched. I think it's actually more responsible and probably more politically efficacious to deal with the relationship between scholarship and academic capitalism. Um, this transformation uh, of knowledge to the terms of, of productivity. So this is where Gary comes in. Um, in the introduction to Digitize Me, uh, on the limits of openness, so Gary Hall points out that this transformation of knowledge to productivity uh, signaled by Lyotard, of course, a symptomatic of the postmodern condition, leads us to all of this emphasis on performance, openness, transparency, efficiency, accountability. The discourses then, the practices, the techniques of finance, all its metrics, citation indices, these are widely and rightly uh, being said to govern academic life now. Uh, but yeah, here comes the kind of feminist Foucauldian stuff again, right? Um, what of differences in gender and other differences uh, uh, in and amongst all this governability? Uh, and this is where the, the Goldsmiths Press will, will take a lead from uh, an international feminist collective, some of you may have heard of, called Fembot. Fembot produces an um, um, online open access non-APC journal called ADA, the Journal of Gender, New Media and Technology. Not surprisingly, Fanbot is attuned <laughs> to gender differences in the increasing demand for free labor uh, and in relationship to peer review practices and re in relation to citation practices. Um, by the way, this issue four, uh, just coming out fairly soon, will deal uh, completely with those sorts of uh, um, gender differences in scholarly practice, so it's worth uh, having a look. Um, Fanboy is also concerned with the differences between earlier and more established career academics. So where, you know, junior academics or early career academics um, are, I would still say, in the front line of a, of a really big change 
um, in the subject positioning or self-positioning of the academic or the scholar entrepreneur, which I think probably is the grim reality. <laughs> scholar entrepreneur. Um, isn't that the grim reality of these new hybrid practitioners? We are very, very, very tempted to celebrate otherwise. Um, and and this, this poor person is urged, uh, um, and I have heard many anecdotes to this effect, um, to engage in, in what a colleague of mine described as spectacular displays of productivity, mm. embodying the persona, the practices of the kind of lone, library-bound, dusty, default, masculine, intellectual, with uh, media savvy, media trained, blogging, tweeting, podcasting, celebrity PR person, right? Um, what I most uh, appreciate actually about the, the Joanna Drucker piece is, is the way she exposes all tech only solutions, uh, including the ones we like at the moment. Not the blogging, not the podcasting so much, but the multimodality, for instance. She exposes that as part of a tech only solution to the so-called crisis in academic publishing, which could, you know, it kind of caught me, caught me out a little bit. It's uh, very likely that I'll be editing an issue of Ada on multimodality. So I was thinking, mm, okay. Um, Goldsmith Press will be linked to Goldsmith's I assume you will be linked to our podcasting uh, service. We'll seek out uh, um, forms and formats suited to our specialisms in visual and media arts. You can see the problem. Uh, at the same time, we'll probably likely co-publish I mean, a series of books that's precisely directed against TED thinking, <laughs> against the kind of uh, uh, um, rationality behind TED thinking, the reductionist, the technicist stuff. So um, ultimately, I agree with John Drucker. There are no quick, no tech-only solutions uh, um, in academic publishing. And this is not about from two crises. It's about something much more insidious, uh, uh, um, uh, much more naturalized, these entrenchments, these extensions of instrumentalization, masculinization, and marketization. Um, the poor do it all scholar entrepreneur, that's you and me as well, I think. Um, this exercises me a lot. There are very few options, I think, for communication. Um, if we accept that the place that we, they are coming from is a research monograph, is the article, is the book chapter, and the place that we're allegedly going to is the TED Talk. Okay. So the point of the press, Goldsmith's Press, isn't to join the innovation bandwagon in publishing, or it will be a side effect. <laughs> um, the point is to intervene by at least striving to keep open. Uh, uh, it's the striving thing that will matter. Uh, the politics of communication, the politics of knowledge, in a context in which these are always being shut down. It's not new. It's not just digital. They've always been being. You know, it's one of the central paradoxes of of of, of change in the in the creative or cultural industries, in in media technologies, in communication technologies, in biotechnologies. The more the possibilities for change open out, the more they are kind of, in a sense, proportionately shut down. Um, it's a dynamic. We will try and at least redirect a little bit of free labour here and there, including mine, um, uh, because I too, do currently edit two mainstream academic journals. Uh, on, the, on the techniques and technologies of regulation, I think probably be more attuned to differences than, than to sort of seeking to make transparent practices of pe peer review and citation. Um, of course, a new press will reconstitute ideas about utility reconstitute ideas about auditability, it will feed the ref amongst other uh, such monsters. Um, but it'll also try and make it sick, you know, ill, slightly off color, create some possibilities for fault lines and failures amongst auditability and utility. And, and the, you know, that's quite simple, actually. It's about a long tradition, a fine tradition of publishing stuff that messes up the boundaries of arts and humanities and social sciences and creates just a little bit of space uh, for the poor scholar entrepreneur to play. So just to finish, the play thing is serious um, with Haraway on that one. Uh, play is serious. It's also serious business because I'm a feminist scholar entrepreneur, right? Um, play is gendered for me. Uh, uh, it's manifestly not 
sort of founded on what a, uh, one of my favourite feminist thinkers calls this frightful masculine fashion of speaking in order to be right. Brackets, how ridiculous. Uh, so play is, is, is serious, it's gendered. Its mode for me is writing. Uh, um, writing understood by Derrida to significantly exceed the word, understood by Foucault to not equal freedom. Alas, what a shame. Um, and writing elevated by, by Donna Haraway, not least in the Cyborg Manifesto, as the ultimate technique of rewilding, of repurposing where we're at. Okay, I think that's me done. Thank you.